How's it going guys? Another episode of Entrepreneur Weekly. This one is a special one. We are here with my friend Sergio. He is a actually a professional soccer player. Um, he signed to San Jose Earthquakes and is playing for the USL Reno uh, 1864. Sorry about that Reno. <laughs> but it's great. You guys are going to get to hear a lot of his story. He came basically from nothing. Um, became a professional soccer player. Still went through a lot of struggles throughout his life. So I think it's important for everybody to really hear his story. So. Let's get into it, brother. How's your day been today, man? It's good. Thank you for having me. Oh, dude, to be it's here. an honor, bro. I think I was trying to get you since like two or three weeks ago before you went out of town again. But um, so what I want to hear from you, brother, and just because we have some of the same same uh, stories and some of the same upbringings, um, like where did you grow up, man? What, what was your place of origin? So, okay. Yeah, so I was born in Mexico, Parra, Chihuahua, and I was raised there until I was seven years old. Okay. Um, it's a pretty small town in Chihuahua. Um, population really really small compared to Albuquerque. Albuquerque is a big city, but it's pretty small. I came over when I was seven and a half around there uh, with my parents and my family and um, it was just from there I grew up here in Albuquerque, went to Governor Bay Elementary School, then I went to Cullen Middle School and then I went to the Norte High School for one year and I went to Cibola. I ended at Cibola. Okay. And that's uh, yeah. How did you make that transition? What did you used to do? Like when do you remember anything from your childhood, bro? Like when you were in Chihuahua? Oh yeah, absolutely. My cousins. You have your all your cousins there. You have your your family members. We used to run around, ride bikes, all the all the fun stuff. I used to go. To, I went to school there for kindergarten all the way to half a second grade. Okay. And uh, I I remember just having lots of fun with my cousins, riding bikes, like I said, and. Just being jokesters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. No, yeah. that makes sense. I mean, all us Mexicans, we have so much family, dude, especially when we're back home, you know, you get to see everybody. When did you fall in love with soccer? Was it when you were back in, in Mexico, man? Or what was your first memory of playing soccer? You know, I, I didn't really like soccer at first. When I was in Mexico, all my cousins played. Okay. You know, my cousin, we call him, you know, well, we don't call him, it's his name, but. That, no, we, yeah. yeah Leon, 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 don't know the Mexican culture. Yeah. We have nicknames for everybody. All the time. <laughs> Leon and Sammy are my cousins. They love to play soccer all the time. So I played with them, but not because I liked it, just because they made me play. Yeah. I came to Albuquerque and I started playing about half a year after I came here. And then I didn't really like it either. I was trying to be a keeper. I played for this club named Club America, it was from the uh, Alameda Club. Okay. And then I was just just playing, just because something to do. We saw a flyer. Actually, you know the funny story? We saw a flyer at, uh, what was it? The pizza place, the Peter Piper Pizza. Oh, okay. And he said, come try out for this team. So we went to go see if we could try out, and um, then nobody showed up. Oh, so really? later that day, we go to the park. It was just my family, my parents, my brothers. We're playing soccer, and we see these two older men playing soccer. We're like, hey, can we play with you guys? They ended up recruiting me to their team, Club America, and that's how I got to know them and their team. I think it was about a year after when I started scoring a lot of goals when I was like, okay, I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now, now you and can maybe. Yeah, and I just like being competitive. That's what I really, really liked. I think I fell in love with the competitive side of soccer. And I think it was around maybe eight or nine years old. I was like, okay, I really like this thing. I like doing tricks, I like scoring goals, and that's when I started falling in love with it. Did you, so after you, know, after you start playing and everything's going well, what, what position did you play? Or? What was kind of like your goal at that time when you were like, okay, I'm gonna start playing soccer eight, nine years old, you know, like, this is what I want to do now. Like, what, what was your mindset at that time in terms of doing it for a long time or just a little pastime? So when I was about nine, I didn't really think about it. I just loved playing, I loved competing. And I was a forward because I liked to score goals. Yeah. And I scored tons of goals when I was small, tons of goals. I remember that uh, our team mom would keep stats of our goals. I scored like 63 goals in a season. No way. Yeah. <laughs> that, it's funny that you say that because even just going back to what you said earlier, same thing when I was playing soccer, I saw a flyer for uh, for the, what's that soccer club in the, in South Valley Soccer Club. Uh -huh. So when I started playing with them, I saw a flyer too at Rio Grande High School and I went to go try out and I made the team. But also I scored 64 goals when I was eight years old, dude, in, the, in that league. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. It's crazy man. to think about. Yeah, absolutely. It's just. And then after that, I just well, I was a forward for most of my childhood until I went to uh, Rush 98. Yeah. So there was this guy named Pac Chamasias who always wanted to come for me to come to this team named uh, Caliente. Okay. Who turned to Rush 98, but I didn't really want to. I was super faithful to a team that gave me an opportunity and all these things. But when I finally made the jump to this very very competitive team, I I was playing midfielder, and okay. then I played midfield for most of my life until I got to college. When I got to college, I started playing attacking mid. 
and that's why I played in the pros. I also played like a, an eight. Okay. For people who don't know what an eight means, it's kind of like a holding midfield, but you can kind of still attack and stuff like that. Yeah, so. it's like a kind of like a center, center, to center, basically. You know, yeah, like a box to box, mid, box to box mid. Um, in that time frame, though, where when did you start to realize that? maybe you want to do this like for the rest of your life or like when did you think it was going to be something um, that you wanted to do professionally? Um, good question. I don't think it hit very like strong. I think it was something that I always felt since I was maybe nine when I started feeling like, okay, I'm pretty good at this. I thought, okay, maybe I can be professional. I said, okay, I want to, the funny thing is I was always like, I want to do the pros, maybe be a ref, be a soccer player, something, <laughs> something, something, yeah, soccer player. something like that. But then, I think it was when I started, when I went to Spain, when I went to Real Madrid, I was like, okay, may, maybe I can play professional, maybe I can actually do this. Not maybe I can, I said that I can do this, I can actually be a professional. And I think when it really, 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 really hit when that I can actually do this, pursue it was my junior year of college, when I was okay. I'm thinking about going pro in this league, and so on. So that's yeah. when it really hit. Yeah, I can do this. But other than that, I think you always, as a kid, have a aspiration to be a professional. For example, like when I was in high school, oh, I want to go travel for Real Salt Lake Academy. I want to go play for this team. Maybe I can be a pro. And that's when like I could maybe look for the yeah, the just rest. kind of setting the goals. Since, since you, I mean, but at, 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 to a certain extent, you have to have. You also have to be real with yourself, you know. So I'm sure you kind of came to that sort of, you know, point that you said, okay, I'm actually really good at this, so I do want to be pro because there's other people that are not very good, but they still, like, have their minds that they want to go pro, you know, mm -hmm. so, like, it's, when did you, like, really start believing, and that's what I, that's, that's the question I want to know, is, like, how, when did you really start believing, like, you knew for a fact, like, I'm going to go pro, like, there's no other way around it, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So that, that goes into a lot of things, for example, the power of the brain, so I think a lot of people aren't, they like aren't there yet, but can't get there. It's all about yeah. mindset. People think that it just happened overnight. That I was just super good. I was just talented. That's not true. And most of my teammates in high school and co in college as well can vouch for me when I speak about this. When I, I train every day. I train maybe twice a day sometimes. Yeah. It doesn't happen overnight. And the reason that happens is because in my brain, every time I go to see, I'm gonna be a pro. 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 And that that kind of like embeds your brain to start thinking and start acting upon it. So that's why I'm, I'm a big believer in the brain. It is. It's the same thing with school too. I'm going to get an A. I'm going to get an A. I'm going to get an A. So you start working towards that. So for people who are like, they're being real with themselves, you also got to be real. Why don't you say, I can do this, I can do this, and work for it. So for me, it was more of, I believed it, it just had to happen. Yeah. Because I believed it since I was maybe 10, 9 or 10, and I just, every night, God, I want to be a pro, I want to be a pro, I want to be a pro, every night. And slowly, things started happening, kind of subconsciously, I didn't notice them, Yeah. but I did notice them. For example, I started getting offers to go to Real Salt Lake Academy, Dallas Academy, all these things started happening. Why? Because I was putting all this work in. So, Pete, and, that, and that's one of the things that I like to talk about too, is like that, that work that isn't seen by others, you know what I mean? Like, even for myself, it's just like, you know, people will come into the store and they'll see me there, you know, every day. But they also don't know the fact that I get four hours of sleep or I'm constantly reading books or I'm constantly trying to, you know, make sure that no matter what type of day I'm having, I always give my best mm -hmm. to them, you know, as, as I represent customer service, you know. Um, so it's just like that, that extra work. How many hours of, you know, training do you think that the people don't know about that you have to go through? It's hard to put a number on it for when I'm before the season or during the season? Just any time, bro. Like, I mean... You know, because what, what we usually do is like, for example, when you're in high school, you know what I mean? You see, you go to training with your high school team and then you play on, you know, Wednesday or Saturday. Those are like the things that people see, right? Those are like the mandatory practices. Right. But what, I, what I'm interested in, in talking about is like the actual work that is not required. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That extra work that you're like, hey, I'm just going to go today. I'm going to wake up at six. I'm going to go work out. Mm -hmm. And then at eight, I'm going to go play. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So I'll give you like a regular week of what I went through in my senior year of high school. And so this is what it looks like. So Mondays, uh, we, so with Rush 98, we would train, then I think it was Tuesday, Thursdays. Okay. So that, but we also were going through high school season. So what I would do is um, when it was high school season, I would go to school, 6 in the morning till 
to around two yeah, seventy thirty five. It's been six years. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> Five years. And then um, after after high, uh, high school, I went to high school training, okay. which is like an hour and a half. And I had a, I had a job at Jason's Deli, so I would go work at Jason's Deli. And after I got out of Jason's Deli, I would come back to my house and I'd run on the treadmill for about forty minutes. Juggle. I went to sleep around two in the morning every time. I'm more of a late night worker and early morning guy. So yeah. <laughs> I would stay up late, just juggling, working on moves, running. I'm, I was always super fit. Tuesdays, it was more of school and then training with, I took the bus as well. I didn't have a car. I went to school and then I went to go train with Rush 98s. Then I trained immediately right after with either was a Rush uh, 95s or 94s. Okay. And I would do that Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Wednesdays are the same as Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. And so it's maybe a couple sessions a day. That's crazy, man. And then games on Saturdays, and then Sunday was off. And that's what it takes. I mean, it takes that extra work, bro. Like, and that's why I tell people all the time, man. Like, you, you can, if you want stuff to happen for your life, like, you have to take control of it, and you have to do that extra work. You know what I mean? Like, people are going to tell you, okay, well, this is what's required of you, okay? If you're going to do this job, it doesn't matter if it's a corporate job or you play soccer. And I'm sure you see this now that you're in the professional. Um, the guys that that you know that are more successful are the guys that stay after training and train themselves mm -hmm. or you wake up before get there an hour before everybody else you know mm -hmm. and i'm sure that's the kind of guy that you are especially mm -hmm. you know what you just told me so um for those people that are like on the edge of i want to do this or i want to you know um, push myself to be this but don't have the drive like what, what would you tell somebody like that ah the drive has to come the drive has to come but I would tell them to do whatever you need to do to, for what you want. Yeah. For example, when I went to the Norte Middle, uh, High School, I wanted to transfer to Cibola to be my friend and play for that soccer team. My parents said, okay, you want to go to Cibola? It's 20 minutes from my house. You, you get yourself there. I said, okay, I'll do it. So I took the bus my sophomore and junior year, the city bus. The city bus all the way to The city bus from, yeah. from San Pais all the way to Cibola High School every single morning six in the morning to catch on the bus, it's freezing. But I had to do it, why? Because I wanted it. Yeah. The same thing with my job and the same thing with training. My parents work 50 hours a week. They can't make me go, and they can't take me to the trainings, yeah. but I wanted to do that. So what I do, I took the bus, I got rides, I did what I had to do. The same thing with school. I didn't like school very much. I wasn't very good at it, but I had to do it. And that's where my drive came through. I had to do those things. Just to put yourself in mm -hmm. the, in the, did you, was it like subconsciously were you right even right now are you still thinking about like you know like giving your family sort of like a better life through what you're able to do um, uh, i don't yeah. know i mean you know personally I, we can talk a little bit more too of how much maybe you guys struggled um mm -hmm. as a family if you did struggle you know like where you guys kind of mm -hmm. came up and how you were brought up yeah absolutely so so in mexico we were we're okay we were well off because my dad and his brother owned a company that was good at transferring lumber okay but then his brother died uh, in a car accident, unfortunately. Yeah, so then the, comp the company kind of fell apart. Nobody knew how to take care of it. So then this is a time where like, all the nar los narcos and see, all see. those, uh, the guys who sell cocaine, all those things were killing a bunch of people. And, and you know, when yeah, it's, go back. it's tough what's happening down there, man. It sucks that our, you know, that our people, especially, you know, us that are Hispanics, Mexicans, dude, like, it's tough seeing all that stuff bro. Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. Especially back then when it was even worse. Yeah, when it started off, when it started, started, started those things, yeah. So then we decided, my parents decided to move to just protect our family. Yeah. When we came here, it's difficult. My, both my parents finished college. They can't use their degrees here in the America. But they were able to get jobs working in the food industry. Okay. And they've been providing for the family since then, working at, my mom worked at Food Ruckers, my dad okay. worked at Cheddar's. A lot of food industries, they both, they both cook, so um, it's a blessing for sure, but I've realized how much they do for our family, and yes, you hit a good point, I do want to see them have a better life, and most of the things I do is for my family, but I also do it for myself, Yeah, I do it for myself and for my family, and uh, seeing the way that they work, they come home, they don't want to go out anymore because they're so tired, their legs are hurting, my dad mentally exhausted, it's just difficult to see that. Yeah. And that kind of drove me even more to be successful as well. Yeah, I know, and, and it's, I think it's it's so funny because I think the people now that are more 
to have that drive with like people that basically come from nothing, bro. And then that's not to say that people that are well off or that have you know like a good a good home or a good upbringing aren't driven or can be successful. But I think to a certain extent, like the people that are you know that struggled for the most of their life, I think those are the people that usually come up on top. You know, whether it be not necessarily at the first time at the first try, mm -hmm. but gradually they, they get a little bit better and we make shit happen for ourselves, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's because they see how much people struggle and they know what it's like. Yeah, I feel so that. I think that's part of it too. I feel that with my family as well. I mean, my mom still works at McDonald's. My dad's been working at, uh, it's called Mission Foods. So he's like, a, he drives a, a semi. He just delivers like tortilla and chips. Mm -hmm. And he's been waking up three in the morning to, he works till like five in the afternoon for 20 years already, man. Yeah. So it was kind of the same for me and, and this, this is why we connect so well because same thing, man. like everything that I do is for me, but also because I want to create a legacy for my family. You know what I mean? Like when they get to the point where they can't work no more, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you know, like these type of jobs, cheddars, flood records, they don't provide like a, uh, a retirement plan, you know, right. like after you're done, you're done. That's it. You're on your own, you know? So that's kind of where we come in play and, and we have to be able to provide something or come up with something for them to do when they retire, you know? And I think that's a, we have a similar story to many kids here in Albuquerque too. Yeah. The difference is they don't want to separate themselves. Yeah. And I think that's a big problem. And like I was speaking to you about, we went through the same thing. We, every single person goes through these things. When yeah. you're in middle school, you're in high school, you see drugs, you see women, you see relationships, you see uh, gangs, you see fights, all these things. But the, what the person doesn't understand is you can separate yourself from it. You don't have to be that cool guy to bully this guy. You don't have to... Um, have the nicest shoes, you don't have to be the toughest guy out there. You gotta do things for yourself, you know? And like that's what separated me, I think, is I was like an even medium yeah. where I didn't really pursue the gang life, the the drug life, the parties, the women, all these things. It's yeah. just and I think that's what made me really successful at the end is that I definitely had the the mindset to say I can do this and for me to do this I can't be a bot around these people. No, definitely. And, and again, you know, that's your natural leader, you know, that just comes down to being a natural leader because maybe at that point you didn't realize that you were a natural leader, but now I'm sure if you look back at it, you're like, oh, maybe, you know, because I didn't follow these people, you know, that's where I am or that's where you are now because you're, you know, more successful. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the people that you were hanging around with back then are probably still doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I love all, I have so many friends that way too, man. I love all of them. But at a certain point, again, you have to realize like, this is what I want in life. This is where I'm at now. I could either choose this path or I can go to that path to whatever they're doing, you know, for short term success or ride the wave and get long term success my own way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, where did you grow up here in Albuquerque? What part of what part of Albuquerque did you grow up? So I grew up, do you know McKinley Middle School? Like by Comanche and, uh, was it Comanche and Carla? Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen it, but I know the area. Yeah, so it's around there. So it's a. Uh, McKinley Middle School back then was known to be very, very, very like bad. Okay. So all the kids around there were very bad. Even I was like considered bad because I'm yeah. in that area. But I grew up there and uh, did most of my years in Cleveland Middle School. I didn't want to go to uh, McKinley because uh, the 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 word around was like, it was pretty bad. So yeah. I didn't go there. You don't want to be around all that stuff, man. No, it's hard though. Yeah. It's hard. I would want. I definitely wouldn't want to do the same thing. So you grew up around the area, you know, where there's a lot of. It's known for a lot of, you know, bad things, drugs, whatever the case may be. Um, what was your mindset back then? You know, like you, you were able to separate yourself, but how hard was it to separate yourself? Oh, that's a good question. It's actually very hard. It's easy to get, not manipulated, but it's easy to get led into it. Because you don't think about it. You're with your friends. Oh, let's do this. All right, let's go. I used to do this all the time. Yeah. I, I could say it because it's happened. We used to be in the school. We say, hey, let's go take that backpack. Why not? We're bored. Why not? Let's do it. Let's get in the fight. It's super easy. Super easy, but when you start thinking about the consequences, for example, when we took the backpack, we got suspended. When we fought, we got suspended. Yeah. And every time I got suspended, my parents were pissed, I couldn't play soccer, and my coach found out. So if that was hurting my soccer, I couldn't do it. Yeah. So that, that means I had to separate myself from those people. So that means I had to do my either different friends. And that happens through your whole life. It happens in high school, it happens in college, and it happens now. Yeah. Who you surround yourself with. That's true. And they say, I mean, the, what that big saying, that you're the you're the medium of your you know the top five people that you hang out with, mm -hmm. and that's very true. You know, if you hang out with three people that are bad influences and two that are good, chances are you're probably not doing so well. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it has to do a lot with with your surroundings. But I also do you think it's a little bit more because me personally, 
I, I grew up in the South Valley. Um, I did get sucked into like a lot of bad things that I'm not like super proud of, but I was able to kind of escape again. Some of the people that I used to hang out with are still there, mm -hmm. um, but I was able to kind of, you know, escape and do a little bit better for myself. But do you think like some people just like feel trapped or like, what, what do you think is the mindset that, just, that people just can't get away from that? Absolutely. No, I definitely do believe that some people do feel trapped because it could come from like family problems, yeah. relationship problems, it yeah. could come from financial problems that you give yourself to this uh, environment because of a reason. And I've learned to understand people more than just say, why don't you just do this? It's not that easy. If they did, they would have done it before. So yeah. I definitely do think that some people do feel trapped. And for example, like, it could have to do with drugs. When you enter that world, it's hard to get out. It could do with family problems. It might be your way to escape that and yeah. all those things. So I definitely do believe that you can definitely feel like you're trapped. And that's one of the things you're trying to do now, you know, now that well, you, you've been, you know, moved out of Albuquerque for a while, went to Seattle University, um, now you're up in Reno, but is that one of the things you're trying to do now for the city of Albuquerque, now that you've kind of seen, you know, from a, from a different perspective, like what the city's going through right now? Is, mm -hmm. Do you want to kind of better that or what's your goal for it? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I've, I've talked about it a lot on Facebook and how I, want to do a lot of things for my community. Like I'm having that soccer camp here soon, um, the 28th, that I think is going to benefit a lot of kids. Yeah, I'm focusing a lot on sports, but I also am going to talk about life and how I went through high school and some tips. And I definitely want to better these kids because one of the biggest things that I've seen and what I hear all the time, I just heard like a week ago, my little brother said, hey, you want to go play football at Francisco's place? Yeah. And this kid was saying, hey, yeah, hey, congratulations on everything. Like, I think I could have done that, but you know, it didn't work out. So why didn't it work out? Oh, it's, it's too hard because I'm undocumented. I was like, I'm undocumented. It was hard, but it just takes, they don't think they can do it. That's what I'm going to get at. They, every time I ask them, why can't they? Or I, every time I ask them why, they say, oh, I don't think I can. Why? Well, if you tell yourself you can't, then you're not going to do it. That's yeah. the first step. Exactly. That's the first step. You got to tell yourself, I can do this. I can do this. If you tell yourself I can't, then you're not going to do it. That's yeah, it. That's, that's, it's again, it's a mental thing, you know, like, even if, even if you're not the best at what you're, what you're doing right now, but if you mentally tell yourself that you're going to work on it or you're going to be better at it, eventually you will, because guess what? You have more of a, of a drive than the person that's naturally talented because they're naturally talented. They're gonna say, oh, I got it no matter what, you know, but the people that are naturally talented and have the mindset of wanting to be better every single day, those are the people that get ahead. And, uh, I hear that a lot too, bro. And it's so sad. It's so sad that that people think that way, you know, they just like, they, they beat themselves up, dude, and there's no way, like, you know, you, the more, they need to pe meet people like you because of, you know, you've already been through it. Mm -hmm. If they meet somebody like you that's already been through it, they're like, hey man, maybe I can do it too, you know? And you know what, it, it came from my dad, my dad invented that, that thought yeah. in my head, you can do it, you can do it. For example, it, it came with soccer, there was, when I was young, there was this big, tall dudes that had a big growth spurt for me. And I thought, I'm like, Dad, I, can't, I don't think I can take them. Like, <laughs> they're too big, they have long legs, like I can't go around. He's like, yes, you can. It's the first step. Like, yes, you can. So like the process of him telling me, yes, you can, every single time, I'm kind of just like, yes, you can, yes, you can. And then in the game, I'm playing against him. Yes, I can. And you start figuring out, they might be big, but that means you have to keep your space. And that means you have to be quicker than them. Because exactly. taller guys are slower kind of off the first couple of steps. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you have a sprint, stop, and then go again. And that's how you beat them. Exactly. So then you just find ways to, yes, you can. That's the mentality. Yeah. And I literally just heard it like a week ago. The kid was telling me, oh, I'm not talking to I can't. Well, there you go. You can't, so you can't. Yeah, you're beating yourself up, you know? Like, well, what, what do you tell somebody that's already, you know, the most you can do again is just let people know, like, hey, I'm here. I've done it before, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, learn from me. I'm here for, you know, for support, whatever you need. Um, so through these camps you're going to be doing, um, how, how old are, what's the age group that you're... So the ages are, I'm doing one in Santa Fe, the 27th, and I'm doing that, and the ages are U6 through U, uh, U9. Okay. And then I'm doing the elite camp here in Albuquerque, where it's U12 to U17s. Okay. And uh, it's going to be super fun, I'm going to give them shirts and all these things. Because one of the things too is that parents nowadays, they're so... Um, egocentric it's all about their kid and against other kids yeah it's like oh you gotta beat that because i don't like their family and so the kid starts doing the same thing that the parents want and i don't like that they wanted them to 
they want to focus and focus and focus. You gotta have fun. You gotta play 3v3. You gotta go out tournaments and play futsal. You gotta have fun. You can't just be like NPSL or whatever the league there. Yeah, you can't be just yeah, you stay. Up. Like you can't just always want to win championships. Yes, you want to win championships, but in a fun way as well. I used to do 3v3 all the time. I love 3v3. I used to do fun. futsal all the time. <laughs> I love futsal because it's just fun. It's there's not a lot of like pressure. On yeah, that. and I think. Even there, I was competitive, but it's a fun competitive. Exactly. It's always fun, but a different type of fun, if you know what I'm trying to say. No, 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 I, I completely understand what you're saying. And it, it's so funny because I think our, our people, our Mexican people are probably at fault the most. When I go to games for like, you know, U7s and U8s, dude, you always have like the Mexican people like just screaming at their son. I feel so bad, man, like kids like crying. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm sorry, you know, like I'll do it, dad. And then you see the different, you know, the, the different coaches are kind of just more like, mm -hmm. no matter if the, the kids are down 20 to zero, they're still pushing them and they're still, but in a night, in a different way. Right. So I think that's, I think parents do need to understand that there's, you know, there's ages and there's also levels of competitiveness that you have to, be okay with you know what I mean right so I think for me personally when I hit 13 and 14 that's when I started being really competitive yeah but even then we still had leagues that we wouldn't go to go play like a futsal we play futsal sometimes coaches and parents don't let them play in those leagues because they're gonna get hurt yeah which could happen it can happen when you don't play in those leagues it can happen at any time I believe that like having fun is definitely like, a big factor of achieving things if you're always pressure 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 since you're nine years old you're gonna get burnt out yeah yeah, and like I think part of that is that I've never been a jealous person. I've never been an envious person. I've never hate on people. Parents do. Even my parents are like, why is their family doing this? Why would you say this? Why don't you do this? Don't pass in the box. Mom, I don't care if I pass the box. I'm just playing. Like, yeah. And then that's another thing I want to teach the kids is you can't be jealous. You can't be, you can't hate upon people. And you have respect. Respect is the biggest thing. That's respect. the big thing. It's respect carries you your whole life. The way you shake somebody's hand, yeah. the way you look at them in the eyes when you're talking, the way you're uh, engaged in the conversation and not daydreaming, all those things are very, very important to me as well. Absolutely, and that's something that yeah, young kids, the, the, the younger you can teach them that, I think the better when they're you know, a little bit older, they'll, they'll realize, like, hey, the stuff that I learned when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, now that I'm 30, like, that helped me a lot, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and maybe it was an ability that I had that maybe other people don't have. That's why I want to give it to other kids because maybe some other people, other kids, players, whatever, their parents say something, their coaches say something, and they keep it. Like, okay, I don't like that guy anymore. Something like that. Maybe they don't have the ability that I have because whenever I heard all these things, chatters, I just block it out. Block it out. Same thing when I play right now. When I play in front of thousands of people, they're talking. How was that sort of, you know, you learned to block out the noise your whole life, but now that you're at, a, you know, at elite level, at a pro level, um, how did you deal with, you know, like, I don't know what kind of nasty stuff people said, you know, now that you're like on the crowds of opposite teams, but how did you, how did you deal with that? Were you able to kind of just, again, block it off like more or was it a little bit harder? I think it was a little harder because there's a lot more people. I was used to playing in front of maybe 4,000 people at most for 4,500 and now I play in front of 9,000 sometimes. When we yeah. go down to El Paso, there's, I made my debut in Fresno and I had 9,000 people there. Um, Phoenix Rising, all those teams, New Mexico, United, they have thousands, like more than 5,000 people. It's yeah. definitely harder. And I personally never received any type of like super bad banter. Like they would call me names and like, oh, number 87, you saw all these <laughs> things, but never something like, oh, like about Mexican or my skin color. Yeah. I've never received anything like that. Okay. And uh, even when I came to, I didn't come to United, but my parents came to United against Reno game. Yeah. And they had their, their, uh, their rush shirts and they were rooting for United or for the Reno team. And the United fans, they get so mad. Oh, you, you Mexicans, go back to your country. They're already telling Oh, them. really? Yeah. It was, it was pretty bad. So, wow. and uh, uh, it was pretty bad. They were about to get in a fight as well. Man, that's kind yeah. of hard. And that's, that's hard to hear, bro. I, yeah. I, I would have thought that of all places, maybe New Mexico would have been the place not to, not to hear all of us. So just because of the culture here, you know. Right. But again, just I don't like to get into politics too much, man. But it's a lot of stuff has been happening around the country now, bro. And a lot of hatred. A lot of hatred, man. A lot of hatred, bro. And it's it's hard to kind of keep your head held high, you know. Like even because I personally have gone through through stuff like that, and it's hard to be the bigger person. Absolutely, it definitely yeah. is. But yeah, I was when my parents told me and my mom like, hey, like after the game or I mean, during the game, they're like, oh, you Mexican, get the hell out of here, like. 
And I think the people who were telling this to my parents were, were parents of a player that played at United. But, oh, wow. yeah, so then I, all these things were happening. I was like, mom, just let it go. It's a, it's a game. Like, what do you expect? So I, that's, that's just how I was built. I just don't listen to it. I don't yeah. think to it. I don't care. You know, so that's just, I want to teach the kids that too. They're going to get all that, all that stuff. Yeah, especially, like in, yeah, especially in our today's world, you know, with Trump and all these things, with how vulgar he is with his words and all that stuff. You got to get used to it. That's the thing, yeah, and, I, and 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 that's one of the things I'm disappointed about. He's, I feel like he's just making everything so. Uh, it's cool to be hating on people, or it's cool to hate people from different cultures, you know. And it's like, dude, it's not about that, bro. Like America was built on immigrant people, man. You know what I mean? Like people from all over. This is the reason why America is the best country in the world because it's so diverse. Right. There's people from all over the place. You know? Yeah, it's definitely really heartbreaking when you see one of the biggest. Uh uh, one, one, the president, one of the biggest, what was he saying, what was I say? Like, the guy you look up for. Yeah. Like, you look, you look up to the president. He's I've the president read, of the United States. And I personally, I mean, like, business-wise, I've read, you know, some Donald Trump books, man. And when he became president and started acting the way he was, I was like, man, it's like... You know, one of the biggest role models in our country, and you, and you were, we're getting that from him. Like, the hatred, the jealousy, all that stuff. Like, it's hard, but hey... Yeah, I guess you gotta deal yeah. with it, and that's one of the things again that that I think you you bring to the table is you know you're able to teach the kids that you gotta look blocked out, don't yeah. hear it, and it's very difficult too here in this town. A lot of people are jealous here in this town. Yeah. That's what I really want to teach these kids, like what I've learned in my life, because I'm doing these camps, and there's other people like trying to copy my camps or kind of trying to copy what I'm doing. Oh really? Here, come here, I'll boost it, I'll repost it, I'll share it. Whatever you need me to do, I don't care. I'm not jealous. I, you do what you need to do. Yeah. And other people are talking bad about me, but I just don't care. That's the thing. I just don't. Well, you gotta, yeah, you gotta go through your own lane. But even that, dude, it's just like the whole point. And I'm sure in the soccer community, especially soccer here in America, is getting there. It's getting to the point where it's like you know worldwide, like the rest of soccer is. But I think there's still a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to you know boost it up and, and do stuff for it, it's so much easier to work together mm -hmm. than you know have those people that are. Well, he's doing this, so I'm gonna do it because I'm jealous of him, and blah blah blah. Like, dude, just work together. Exactly. It's so much easier if you work together, bro. You know how much like, you know how much easier and how much faster we, you know, we could grow if we just helped each other out. So exactly. much faster, yeah. And I've always been like that. For example, when I grew up playing, I used to watch Stan and Tenenbaum play all the time, Justin Schmidt, all these players. But I was never jealous. Like, yeah, Justin Schmidt, Stan and Tenenbaum playing against. Like, I always have like, even when I play against him right now, I'm like, even though I'm in the same level. I'm still super excited to play against or, yeah. or see them and all these things. Like I played against Justin Schmidt in uh, in Seattle when he played for UW, and I was just, oh my god, it's Justin Schmidt. <laughs> Four years older, three years older. Yeah, it's him. I was never like the jealous type. I just yeah. don't understand that part of the. Have you heard that in, in also like in the Mexican culture a lot? Because I I personally heard that a lot of you know with with the Mexican people with our people they they always say that. They, the reason why Mexico is not, you know, advanced is because there's so much jealousy and so much hatred. Mm -hmm. um, when people see somebody doing good, they immediately want to bring them down. Mm -hmm. Do you do you feel that way as well? Like in terms of just Mexican people itself, have you ever kind of heard that or? Uh, I, yeah, I've, I've definitely heard that. I think my family has been very different in terms of what we experience, but uh, I could definitely see that because Hispanic people are do are very like that. Yeah. <laughs> They like to bring people down. It's, it's true, but uh, my family not really. My family sometimes, and I and I don't really listen to it, but not very to that extent. But I could definitely see that in Mexico they're very corrupt. Yeah. It's all about money. It's all about politics. All that good stuff. So like, I do believe that people that are are supposed to make the national team aren't making it because of certain reasons, jealousy, all these things. So there's a reason why like, our U16s, U17s win the World Cups and our national team don't. Does it? Yeah. yeah, because they. Yeah, it's a lot. Of Soccer in general, I think it's a lot of a lot of politics going on. Um, I think it's one of the sports where the politics don't matter as much because there's basketball, uh, you know, boxing, especially in boxing. Yeah. Bro, like the politics are crazy in boxing, man. Absolutely. You would see the people. There's two people that I know that freaking run the sport: Bob Arum and then I forgot the other promoter. That's it. Those two, they move everything, bro. Yeah. So it's crazy to see, man. But what do you what do you think about soccer in America, bro? Because before, you know, like. The MLS, I think, has been one of the last um, places where, in the last seven years, it's been growing so much because of you know players they've been able to bring abroad. 
But what do you think about that whole movement now that it's getting popular? It's getting uh, to a big place. So I think America is definitely getting very uh, a lot of exposure to other players uh, outside of the country that brings in tons of attention, like Slata, like Pirlo, all those yeah. players that say it's a good league. They say it's a good league, even though they're thirty five years old, but. Uh, they say it's a good league, but personally, I think I was very blessed when I was growing up with people who were around me and, and supported me because if it wasn't for those people, I wouldn't have been able to play for flights or tournaments. So I think that it's definitely expensive and it's getting more expensive to play soccer here competitively. But I was blessed to have people around me that could help me with those things. When I reached the college level, I definitely do think that college is an important piece of uh, growing as a player and as yeah. a person and even in the classroom. So I definitely do promote the college and then go into the pros. USL is, it's getting there, it's getting there. But the MLS is for sure a league that I really, really, really It's admire. growing, it's yeah. growing a lot, it's growing a lot. And the USL, they're getting close to having a players union and they're getting close to doing all these things, good stuff for the players. So I think that it's definitely growing and gonna be in a good direction. In a couple of years, I think it's gonna be a good league. A very That's awesome. Good league. No, I, I completely agree, and I've been, personally, me, I've, only in the past three years, I've really been watching MLS soccer, and it's good, it's good soccer, even the people now, you used to see, you know, like, when you go to, you used to go to soccer games back in the day, and everybody would just be sitting down, kind of watching, yeah. whether as, like, in the rest of the world, everybody was, like, cheering on and going crazy, and now you're seeing that in stadiums all across the United States, dude, I think, Philadelphia Union, is yeah. that a team, I think they, they had, like, I don't know, some type of record for the best crowd or something, Cause they just went crazy over there, man. Yeah, like, crazy there's crazy. a couple of teams that go pretty crazy, like like Philadelphia, like Seattle Sounders. Like yeah, they, they fill up their stadiums like thirty five thousand people every single game. LAFC, LA Galaxy, like all those teams are just. You and go. you don't even see that in other sports: basketball, <laughs> football. You know what I mean? Like I think their their max capacity sometimes is like twenty thousand, twenty five thousand. But soccer, for some reason, is is one of those things that just brings people together, man. Yeah, no matter absolutely. what where you're from or what you're about, you know, like it brings people together. Um, what about a little bit, you know, I know you've been injured a lot. What's your, what was your mindset um, getting back into now that you're a player, professional soccer player? Um, how tough was that to deal with all those, all those injuries this season, bro? That's a good question. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's my first time missing games. In my whole college career, I played every single game, every single minute. Well, not every single minute, if we were winning, we would come out. But, it was hard, difficult, not being able to play. You know, I, I had a back injury. I had a bulge disc from lifting differently. Um, I had a knee injury, an MCL partial tear. tear. Oh, wow. Yeah, so then I also had my hernia that I just got surgery on it. So it's definitely been a rough year for me. I did get to play 16 games, which is very good for a rookie. Okay. But at the same time, that's not who I am. I'm not used to that thing. So it's very challenging mentally. And I think the biggest thing, you know, Slowly, my mindset was changing, but I didn't allow it. Slowly, it was telling me, maybe it's your time to stop playing, or maybe uh, you're not good enough. No, and like, I had to block it out. I said, yes, I'm good enough. I'm gonna get over this injury. I'm gonna come back even better. This is part of the life. Yeah. A lot of people get injured. So I think my mentality was very, I'm gonna come out very, very strong after this uh, injury right here that I have. So I think that it's crucial, your mindset. Your mindset is crucial. Definitely. Um, did you go from, I mean, I don't know, I personally, I'm not going to lie, I didn't follow the, the USL too much season, but did, in college, you know, you were a top player. Mm -hmm. um, when you went to Reno, was it, was it tough to kind of get used to being, you know, being the top guy mm -hmm. at a club or at, you know, at the university to being just another player mm -hmm. for a team now? So I think that it was definitely very difficult, not because I couldn't do it, but because I wasn't able to do it. The whole season, I think we seventy percent. The whole season, yeah. there's not. I don't think there's one game where I could say, okay, I'll let a hundred percent, because I got hurt in preseason with my back, and I was not able to sprint the way I wanted to sprint or yeah. move the way I wanted to move. So, when I went to Seattle, I was not the top dog, but after my first year, it was different. I, yeah. I showed myself. You proved so it was definitely very challenging to try to show myself in the pros, but I couldn't. It's not that I wasn't. It's that I couldn't show it. Yeah. So it was definitely very difficult to be able to come from like the top dog, top ten in the draft, whatever, like all these things, like to go into I can't perform. You know. How how did you stop yourself? Like whenever you're, 
you know, you go through four or five different injuries. How did you stop yourself? Um, you know, mentally, because you said you were able to block it off, but how? How did you manage to block off that, you know, your mind telling you, like, I'm done, I don't want to play anymore? So I think that it's, there's a couple of things that I use. So, for example, um, uh, like post-it notes around the house, around my apartment, I post that I can do it. I post them that said I can do it. Then I post a note, positive thoughts. And then I post it, like, if I go to the restroom, I'm washing my hands, there's a post a note right in front of me that says, you'll get over this. Like just positive things that remind you and slowly your brain started believing it and believing it and believing it. So that's a way that I do it. Okay. There's other ways that I wish I could talk about, but... <laughs> no, I we're saving that for later. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. No, and man, that's actually a good technique because I think so many people get used to, you know, doing the same thing over and over. You get so used to a routine and you get to a certain point where you run out of, you know, ways to push yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a level of creativity that I might start using around here, man. I'll probably start using posting notes from now on <laughs> just to remind myself I still got it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Talk about positive talk. It is. What you tell your brain, you're going to believe it. You have to hype yourself mm -hmm. up. There's been so many times, even just in this past eight months, that, that you know, being a, a partner in one of the locations that I've wanted to quit, man. This past time, you know, this past November, we lost money. The first time we, you know, we took a loss in terms of the business. Not because we didn't run the business correctly. It's just, you know, not enough sales generated. It's cold. But... When you go from every single you know time again you know it's kind of ties down my, my business side and your soccer side but you know when you go from being the top person you know like mm -hmm. always producing always producing and there comes a point where you go through the injuries I go through losing money yeah you think to yourself like man yeah. not those ten things that I did right aren't gonna match the one thing that I did wrong and that's you what sucks I mean? about it isn't it yeah, it's the same thing when people say you did. Ten great things in the soccer field, but that one bad thing, everybody's gonna remember. Yeah, and that's what sucks too. That what you were saying, that yeah. losing money, this injury tops everything. Yeah, it does. It but does. you gotta find ways to motivate yourself. Exactly. You gotta find what works for you. Everybody's different. Yeah. What works for me, it was my positive self talk, watching my old videos. How I used to play. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You did. That, you did that a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah, all the time. Just watch up, and that motivated me when I wasn't able to play these past three months. I watch my videos, I can be that guy even better, you know, and you guys, you start believing it. Do you dissect yourself a lot? Like, do you, you know, like at the end of the night, do you kind of like go back and, you know, think about your day and, and sort of, you know, um, think about what you could have done better maybe? In terms of soccer or in general? Just in general. In general, I do. In soccer, I really, I try, but I can't because in soccer, I just, I just play. Yeah. I, I don't think about it, I just play. Um, I think about positioning subconsciously, but it's just something embedded in me that I already have. In terms of the, the way that life goes, yes, I do. How can I have uh, made that conversation better? How can I have this? I've done this business, this deal better. Like all these things. How can I have woken up earlier and made my day better? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely do dissect myself. Have you uh, have you thought about you know life after soccer? Is there any any certain thing that interests you in terms of you know getting your career done after soccer? Yeah, absolutely. So after soccer, I really want to be a public speaker. So I already have, I already did a speech in Seattle in front of maybe 450 people, nice. donors, top donors for the Seattle University community, oh, owners wow. of the Space Needles, owners of the, the t biggest towers there, just very uh, important people. So I think that I could definitely be like an influence here in Albuquerque, go talk to the community, go talk to the, to the middle schools and just talk about, my biggest thing is they don't need to do these things to look cool. They don't need to do... Rob, they don't need to fight to be with the cool kids. You can do something way better, way better. They just don't know it. Yeah. And if they see me, they're like, oh, maybe they can relate. And out of 3,000 people in that school, you know how many people are going to listen? I don't. What like do 10. Yeah. Like 10 true. are going to listen. And that's 100%. the truth. That's the truth. 100%. But those 10 could change even lives of more people and more people. And that's how you build it. I think that's very important here in Albuquerque, man. Just it's it's tough that you know that we grew up here and just seeing how the the city has you know it has its up and downs you know we go through a time where there's so much violence and we go through a time where it's you know fine and then again so much violence and stuff like that so i think the community needs people like you you know to make sure that it doesn't matter what you go through doesn't matter what happens in your life like you have to come out on top you know what i mean absolutely um just to kind of close it up a little bit, so we'll talk a little bit more, more about your uh, your clubs going on that you're going to set up. So you're going to set up your camps. Mm -hmm. um, 
what is the whole process for people that might want to be interested in, in getting into that? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I think the registration is closing soon, but so the process is they can add me on Facebook, Sergio Rebus. Don't forget that. Uh, and then they can, they see my links. They can go to the Rush website, NewMexicoRush.com, and I'll have a Sergio Rebus camp there. Okay. And they can sign up. It's uh, an elite camp. It's for it's gonna, only going to be 20 kids that I'm choosing. When you sign up, 20 kids. Are you like choosing them personally? Yes. Okay. 20 kids. Well, they can sign up, but I can choose if I want them or not. Oh, okay. 20 kids that I want to that want to better themselves in all aspects of their lives, not just soccer. Soccer is a small, small aspect. There's a, all those things, and then add me, and they can see the links, and then they can sign up and stuff like that. They can message me at any time. Perfect. Mm -hmm. What do we have? Let, let's do it, man. I think that's that's something that again the community needs is you know. People like you, bro, you're, you're an awesome dude and just having this conversation with you, I've learned a lot from you. Um, I think that, you know, your tough shell that, that you carry yourself with and, and that mindset that you're, you know, you're going to get through whatever, whatever comes your way. Um, a lot, a lot more people need to think that way, but thank you guys so much for watching this episode again of Entrepreneur Weekly. Sergio was an awesome guest. Anything you want to close up with, Sergio? No, thank you for having me. It's an amazing show you have here and I hope to be back one day. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, brother. We'll see you guys soon. Take care.